Logical gymnastics. Our next spe speaker today is Hanisha Kalothbrun. She's entering the second year for PhD in music theory at the Eastman School of Music. Originally a Toronto native, she previously received her BM in music history and theory at Wilfrid Laurier University and her MM in music theory here at Michigan State University. Her research focuses on rhythm and meter in rap music and its intersections with gender and narrative studies. She is the 2021 recipient of MTSC's Irna Priore Prize and the 2022 recipient of TSMT's Colvin Award. Hanisha has been invited to several schools as a guest lecturer for her work on Nicki Minaj, including Northeastern University, Queens University, and Indiana University. Please welcome Hanisha for her paper, sorry, entitled Centering Meter, uh, Centering Meter Provincializing the West Toward a Diversified and Inclusive Music Theory Curriculum. You can hear me? Okay, cool. Um, before I get started, uh, I invite you to uh, get the QR code up. It'll have a handout that I'll be using um, and kind of relying on pretty heavily. And it'll also have by my full uh, bibliography. Okay. In Gary Karpinski's 2000 article, Lessons from the Past, Music Theory, Pedagogy, and the Future, he assesses and critiques the state of music theory pedagogy at that time. He focuses on the topics that frame the way instructors organize their courses, like counterpoint, figured base, oral skills, and computer-assisted instruction. While he brought up excellent ways to improve the curriculum two decades ago, I believe there are a few key issues that should continue to be our focus as instructors and educators, specifically how to include more rhythm and meter and diverse genres and styles. In a standard music theory curriculum, past and present, rhythm and meter is typically glossed over in the first semester before instructors move on to the more essential harmony and form. Students struggle to grasp these ideas in the limited amount of time that was allocated, and they're not given much priority in the student's work afterwards either. This does not adequately prepare students to engage with a wide variety of music and furthers ongoing issues of diversity in the music theory classroom. In his 2015 article, Richard, Richard Cohn advocates for music theory curricula to reposition theories of meter as a core element to achieve more accurate performances and analyses of classical music. The ongoing lack of diversity in the music theory classroom has always been problematic, but in recent years, scholars have been taking initiatives to overcome this issue, like SMT's inaugural award for diversity course design. Michael Tenzer's course, Musical Rhythm and Human Experience, incorporates rhythm and meter transcription and ethnomusicology into a music theory curriculum for students to reflect on their role as a musician in the modern world. Both scholars share the purpose of including more rhythm and meter studies for students and institutions that might be quite different. Cohn's goals might be geared towards conservatories while Tenzer's goals might be more geared towards liberal arts colleges. In this paper, I expand upon both Cohn's and Tenzer's perspectives. Centering rhythm and meter in music theory curricula create more opportunities to incorporate musics beyond the Western classical canon, such as rap, Hindustani thal, and Western West African drumming. My paper provides the foundations for a rhythm-centered, musically varied theory curriculum by proposing a sample curriculum and some representative assignments that would work well in both conservatories and liberal arts colleges. So first, I'll demonstrate a sampling of meter-related activities that embody my vision of a revised music theory curriculum, and then I'll conclude by sketching parts of a core curriculum that focuses more on meter. Rap can be incorporated into an undergraduate music theory classroom in many ways, some of which is merely an addition to what is already taught in music theory and oral skills classrooms. In the Routledge Companion to Music Theory Pedagogy, Michael Berry discusses one way to include rap in the classroom. He uses a Roland TR-808 to transcribe and improvise backbeats normally heard in rap, which is an effective way of incorporating technology, rap, and rhythm and meter into the classroom. Robin Addis also discusses incorporating lesson plans that use rap songs for teaching concepts like harmonic rhythm, form, and transcribing excerpts of songs. I would like to expand upon their ideas of transcriptions. Transcription is quite similar to rhythmic dictation where the process required to create a transcription involves listening to the passage several times and notating what you hear. And this could work well as part of an oral skills class. 
Here is a sample activity using Missy Elliott's Work It, which can be seen on page one of your handout. And this is a great excerpt to use when working on including different 16th note rhythms in an oral skills classroom. Uh, before I play it, the sound might not be that great. So if it isn't, I'm just going to skip over it. Or not. Play it all. OK, we're not going to listen to any audio today, then. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. OK. Transcription is quite similar to rhythmic dictation, where the process required to create a transcription involves listening to the passage several times and notating what you hear. This could work. Oh, sorry, I just read this. I'm going to skip to where I was. <laughs> Students will be provided the lyrics and the number of measures of the passage. And using this information, the students can listen to the excerpt and notate the rhythm in the same way rhythmic dictation is already used in class. This is beneficial to students in many ways. Transcription through rhythmic dictation will continue to develop a student's memory and their ability to audiate what they hear. Additionally, transcription gives students more practice with beaming and notation. Typically, in theory and skills classes, students struggle to understand the intricacies of beaming and continue to have issues with this as they move through the core curriculum. Transcriptions can be a way for students to develop the skill over a longer period of time. If notational skills is not a top priority for an institution, proto-notation is a great way to systematize this while developing the same skills. I will provide a sample proto-notation later on in this presentation. This activity is easily transferable to any verse and rap, depending on the rhythmic topic and the complexity that is required at that point in the curriculum. Another activity that's already included in a theory or oral skills class is error detection, and rap can be included to expand the skills and genres in, used in the classroom. Alexandria Yonker states that, quote, error detection activities can be used not only to teach students how to perceive errors in pitch and rhythm, but also as a way of improving and exhibiting command over other oral abilities. By demonstrating common errors in singing and ear training activities, students are more likely to notice and avoid making these mistakes in their own work. A sample activity is seen in your handout on page two. We could provide this incorrect transcription of Lizzo's Good As Hell and have students correct it. The students would get a few chances to listen to the excerpt and make any corrections to the verse. Proto notation is another option here as well. Here is the correct transcription, and we will not be listening to it, but you can listen to it on your own time. Both rhythmic dictation and error detection are already included throughout a core curriculum, and including this specific genre would not be difficult or affect the overall curriculum that we already have. There are some topics that can be included through rap music that may not normally have the opportunity. Additive meter is something that students will encounter, perhaps through their contemporary repertoire and through new music ensembles. A song called Story 2 uses additive meter to help convey the narrative. So in this piece, since I can't play it, um, it starts in 3-8, then moves to 4-8, then 5-8, then 6-8, all the way up till 4-4, before it does the same thing in triple meter. So it's kind of adding one eighth note each time. So on page three of your handout, you will see a, an activity that could be used to discuss meter through the scaffolding of different meter changes that occur within the song. Students will work in groups focusing on 30 to 40 seconds of music, which would include two to four different meter changes. After working with one another, students will come back together as a large group and walk through the different meters that they heard and how they were able to make that decision. By discussing how they experience the meters, students will not only have to do some self-reflection, but it will also allow for in interdisciplinary conversations about the cognitive aspects of meter. We will then create a form diagram as a class to show how the song is structured, which might look similar to something like this. This can lead to even more discussion about the meaning and the narrative of the song and how that might be related to the additive meter. This is an engaging way of working through a song by not only involving rhythm and meter, but self-reflection, cognition, and narrative, all of which add to a student's knowledge. Rhythm and meter is not only important in the Western canon, but in other regions as well. Instructors could take the opportunity to explore rhythm and meter in non-Western regions, which include, but is not limited to, South Asia and West Africa. In Northern India, musicians practice what is called Hindustani music. Rhythm and meter falls under what is called tal. 
Anjani Amin has done previous work by providing instructors with the materials needed to explore rhythm and meter from northern India in a classroom. Of course, for students to explore music of a different culture, we must take some time to introduce the country, the key artists, and instruments. And this can be done through a virtual field experience. Amin presents a PowerPoint and several handouts that instructors could use to introduce these ideas. Once the students have some background on this new region and culture, we can then move on to the music from this country. Instructors should be mindful that they're teaching music from a region that they're not native to, so I suggest that they educate themselves through a native musician or to bring in a guest speaker for the first class to introduce the topic to the students and even the instructor themselves. These ideas could also be presented through a flipped module approach where students learn about the region and its artists before class through the several online videos that exist and then move on to learning rhythmic ideas when attending class. I would like to present some listening related activities that build upon the materials that Amin has created. Here's a quick background. First, Thal is a repeating rhythmic cycle and there are several different kinds. The difference between the way we experience Western and Hindustani music is that Hindustani Thal is, linear, is not linear, it is cyclical. In order to introduce this idea, I would suggest creating diagrams using a circle instead of conforming to Western notation. However, explaining them as such verbally may be useful for some initial understanding. The idea of using a circle is part of a uh, as part of a repeating idea is seen in Kochavi's article called Clapping for Credit. Here, he uses a circle as a way to represent the repetitive rhythmic idea in Steve Reich's clapping music. This clear visual representation of what was occurring in the music helps the student count and perform this rhythm. In Hindustani Thal, a circle is a great way to represent the different cyclic meters. So I'll tell you a little bit about three of the most common cycles that Hindustani art artists might encounter. Thal, Dradhatral, and Rubathal. A Thal is a 16 beat rhythmic cycle with four sections of four beats, similar to four measures of four four. Dadratal is a six beat rhythmic cycle with two sections of three beats, like two measures of three four. Finally, Rubathal is an asymmetrical cycle with seven beats, uh, three sections of three, two, and two, kind of like one measure of seven four with the three plus two plus two grouping. After learning about these rhythmic cycles, students will work towards identifying them in songs. This can be seen in activity four of your handout. I was going to play an example that was the Ruvakdal cycle, but I can play it for those of you that are interested later on. So in that example, there is a clear pitch difference of the beats in the background that outline that Ruvakdal cycle. Students will be asked to reflect on how they would go about identifying different rhythmic cycles and can collaborate with one another on coming up with a process in which they can do so. So this is another way for students to work on self-reflection and collaboration while still learning about rhythmic structures in a non-Western region. West African drumming can be explored in a similar way to Hindustani Thal. Just like Amin's virtual field experience, similar materials can be developed to introduce different regions, artists, music, and cultures in Africa as a whole. I would suggest the first chapter of Agawu's book, The African Imagination in Music, as a starting point in creating these materials. Carter on Yi created a curriculum called Africana Music Experiential Pedagogy, where there are workshops and courses that emphasize multisensory learning, instrument making, discussion of ethnographic primary sources, and performance seminars. This program, quote, reimagines Africa at the center of digital innovation and music subdisciplines like music theory that rarely engage with Africa in the undergraduate curriculum, end quote. This would be a great starting point for instructors and educators that are uncomfortable teaching students about a region with which they are unfamiliar. Similar to the way Hindustani Thal worked with cyclic rhythms, we could take several rhythms on the djembe and have students perform them as multi-part rhythms. Here is a sample activity also seen on page five of your handout. Instructors can introduce where this rhythm comes from and what it would typically be used for, which can be seen in that handout. Each student in a group of six can pick a different rhythm and work together to figure out how these rhythms align. After figuring out how they would perform all of the lines together, they can answer some self-reflection questions such as which parts of, of were the most difficult to align with the rest of the group and why. 
here, I have provided both a Western notation transcription and a proto notation similar to Kyle Adams's method of notating rap flows. While I believe that it's important to not conform these rhythms to Western notation, I know that others might see the benefit to using Western notation. Either way, I think it's important to acknowledge and be aware of the pitfalls that these no of these notations and what we are missing when reading and learning music in this way. However, there are some advantages to having a visual notation. Agawu states, quote, to say that African musicians did not conceive their music in notational terms does not mean that nothing can be learned from translating it into Western or standard terms. Transcription can and does shed light on such things as the role of repetition, the question of meter, the interplay of timbres, and the internal dynamics of polyrhythm, end quote. It's important to recognize how th these notations help the student, but also how it could take away from the essence of these music. Another notation that might be interesting is Coding's time unit box system, which uses dots and boxes to represent drum strokes, which not only prioritizes rhythm, but also sonority. Many of these activities I've presented would not take up substantial time within a curriculum. In fact, much of these activities could be used as part of the curriculum we have now, especially in oral skills. Skills like rhythmic dictation and error detection already occur in the classroom, so why not expand the types of repertoire and songs that are used to develop these tools? On the other hand, learning another culture will require time that is hardly available in a curriculum. Some concepts and topics have to be sacrificed in order to provide these new topics sufficient time for students to grasp and develop. I think that it is okay for us to make such sacrifices as to help students develop their comprehensive musicianship. I propose a core curriculum that includes a month of meter-related topics before moving on to other concepts. The time being used for meter studies will allow for a strong foundation in the topic before moving on to key signatures and intervals, triads, and seventh chords. This might be a slightly more traditional curriculum than you might have expected, but this would appeal to both a conservatory and liberal arts school since it emphasizes activities students from either schools might benefit from. Instructors can and should sway this curriculum in whichever way they would prefer. After this first semester, there are still several ways in which students can benefit from more rhythm and meter studies. Here's how I propose we can incorporate some of the additional topics I have discussed today. Taking two to three weeks per semester to explore rhythm and meter studies of different cultures within a curriculum would help expose students to music outside of the Western canon. Instructors may eliminate any topics that they believe may not be as beneficial as rhythm and meter. For some, that may be augmented six chords, and for others, it may be rondo form. Either way, there are some sacrifices instructors must make in order to make room for other important skills and tools. One issue that I do not want to encounter is the idea of tokenism. In Kara Stroud's article, she states that, quote, students can take away a limited view of composers as a group with only a single example, end quote. That same can be said about utilizing these topics that I've covered today in a limited way. Two to three weeks per semester of rhythm and meter studies will allow for instructors to expose students to more than one region of music outside of the Western canon. It's also important to note that these non-Western musics are not just significant in rhythm and meter studies and can help in other aspects of music theory. Necessarily, non-Western musical examples can be employed throughout the semester in other topics to avoid the pitfall of essentializing African and other non-Western musics as being worthy of study solely for their metric and rhythmic contributions. One method in which these ideas can be used within a classroom is by dispersing them throughout the semester. Perhaps each module of a music theory course has one week of meter studies along with the typical harmony and form that it may cover, giving it an equal amount of focus. Here are a few sample modules. Each module covers one harmonic, formal, and rhythmic topic. This also allows for students to develop their analytical tools of meter and rhythm over a longer period of time, rather than just to work on it for a month before forgetting the importance of these topics. Overall, I truly believe that the inclusion of rhythm and meter studies will allow for students to become better musicians and analysts since they'll be exposed to a more diverse range of music. Curating a curriculum that provides enough focus on a typically overlooked topic can allow for more opportunities to include diverse genres and cultures of music. Not only will this new curriculum and activities allow for more diversity and inclusion, but it will allow for a more memorable experience for students. 
No curriculum is perfect, though. While I have provided, a sam provided sample activities and a curriculum, this must, this must be modified to fit the needs of the students within your institution. I hope to have provided you all with a starting point and centering meter within your own curricula. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Thanks so much for this. Um, I wondered if you would be able to talk a little bit more about what inspired you to create this and, and or <laughs> where you see this going next for you. Um, so this kind of stemmed out of my advanced pedagogy class with Dr. Callahan. Um, I think, so in my uh, undergrad experience, one of the things we did in my last semester of my oral skills class is learned about scales but as a whole, so you know, we had to sing major, minor scales and pentatonic scales, but we also got to sing ragas and different kinds of ragas. And I, I guess that was a little bit of an introduction to the context behind them. You know, each of them has a certain emotion or time of day that they're sung in. Um, and I feel like that was a very memorable experience for me uh, compared to maybe some of the other things I learned in that class. <laughs> uh, and so I think that was pretty inspiring for me. I'm also, I love, rhythm and meter and learning it in my master's program was a very great experience. I think that now that I'm starting to teach students, I'm noticing that that is one of the topics that they seem to struggle with and we don't really take the time to go through and talk about notation or um, the cognitive aspects of meter and I feel like that's a really important thing to talk about since meter is something you experience. Um, I'm hoping that I can incorporate some of these activities sometime in the future when I am allowed to do that in my teaching. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I, so I, I feel like I think so much about the purpose of, of dictation and whether sitting in silence and transcribing things without moving or making any sounds is like a good, helpful thing to do. And I, I'm curious if you were designing, like some of the first examples you had, which were, they were like dictation examples, rhythmic dictation, but do you, if you were designing the course, do you feel like there would be another way that you would think would be more effective to assess the, the engagement with, with rhythm. Um. Yeah, I think, I, th I think that with dictation, a lot of it has to do with improving your notational skills. But I also think that maybe being able to perform these rhythms back would be a great way to work on your memory and like audiation skills. So even with that Lizzo example, it's like, pretty swung, I would say, the rhythms, but we see that in repertoire all the time where it's written in straight eighth notes, but it's you're told to swing it. So I think one great uh, activity to do with even that example is to get the students to listen to it, but then try and perform it in maybe straight eighth notes or 16th notes and see if they can even try to like modify what they're hearing to kind of fit what they might notate, maybe. That could be a possible uh, way to work with that. Uh, I think that's all the time that we have for now, but if you have more to ask Kanisha, you can ask her later on. Thank you so much.
there's a there's vocals on top of that. You want to try again? I'm playing. I can hear some vocals. Can you hear the vocals on this one? No, it's, it's like it's phasing. Tell me which one is uh, Preston? Preston? Um, Preston, yeah. 